creating an oral history with Mr. Norman Rails, a member of Boca Raton's Jewish community. Hello, Mr. Rails. Hi. Can I call you Norman? Yes, of course. Good. Would you say your full name, please? Norman Robert Rails. R-A-L-E-S? R-A-L-E-S is correct. Okay, and when and where were you born? I was born in the Coney Island Hospital in New York City and lived there for several years only. And what was your date of birth? 7 19 23. Okay. Let's start with your family. What was your mother's name? Sadie. And what was her last name? Hausman, H A U S M A N. Do you know where and when she was born? No. I know where she was born, but not when. Okay. Came from Russia. Do you know how and when she came to America? In 1902. Okay. So she was a young woman? A family of nine. Oh, my. What do you know about her before you came along? Very little. My mother died at a very early age, uh, at 40 years old, when my sister was born at childbirth. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she passed away, I was about five or six years old. I don't remember very much about her on a personal view, but many stories I've heard that were wonderful, and I, I'm the recipient of the most stories. Is there anything about your mother that she passed on to you um, through her genes or in any other way? Everything. My mother was, as I understood, during the Depression years, the most charitable woman around. She had nothing, but she would stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning to bake bread for the people who had less. Those genes were passed on to me. And I learned a great lesson and have put that to work during my lifetime. Did she have children before you? Yes, two brothers and two sisters before me. All in New York? At that time, okay. yes. Um, and do you all have to share the same father? Their parents, the older children, came from a different father who passed away. Okay. Our mother remarried, and I came from the new father. You were the first one? First one. Mm -hmm. And what was your father's name? Solomon. Okay, and do you know about his family? Yes, they came from Austria. And uh, they migrated to the land of opportunity, America, somewhere around that time, 02. Okay, do you know how your parents met each other? I do not. So you were born in 1923. Did they have other children after you? Yes. They had my sister Estelle, who was a year and a half younger than me. My sister Doris, who was two and a half years or three years younger than me. And my brother Morton, who is three years, approximately three years younger than me. Is there anything in particular you remember learning from your father, either intentionally or by his example? Well, my, my father tried very hard to collectively keep the family together. But it was depression years. And no matter what he tried to do, he found it difficult. So three of us, myself, my sister Estelle, and my brother Morton, 
became wards of the Hebrew Orphan Asylum in New York City, which the state sent us there. My sister Doris was given to my aunt Jenny, who handled her for many years as her daughter. Was that after your mother died? Yes. Oh, she, yes. She died giving birth to Doris. Oh, right? yes. Yes. Okay. Um, where did you live as a child? Um, when, at, you, when at, you were not in the At order. five years old or so, when my mother passed away, I was passed on to more than several of my aunts and uncles for a year or two. And uh, where, I did was, you, where did you live when you were all together? New York City. Where in New York City? Brooklyn? Coney Island. Oh, Coney Brooklyn, Island? New York, Coney Island. Okay. Do you remember the street? 23rd Street and Mermaid Avenue. Okay. And I understand you lived at the Hebrew Orphan Asylum. Um, was that on and off? Over no. There? No, no I, I, I lived stay? with my aunts and uncles for several years. And then I was put into the United Oddfellows home on York Avenue in New York when I was about seven years old or thereabouts. And uh, at that time, uh, that was uh, uh, the time that Father Coughlin became very popular in New York City. And he was living or supervising that home. I lasted there about six months and then moved to the Hebrew Orphan Asylum at approximately age eight. Lived there for 10 years or nine years. I understand that the original Hebrew Orphan Asylum of New York City uh, became the largest Jewish child care facility in the United States. Correct. And that uh, immigration from Eastern Europe um, produced a lot of social hardships on the Lower East Side that filled the asylum and eventually they had to turn away the people from Brooklyn because there was no room. And so the Jewish Brooklynites quickly established another one in Brooklyn. And that, that happened before you came along. So I'm surprised that you did not go to the one in Brooklyn. Were you aware of the one in Brooklyn? I, at that time, I was not. Okay. I was only aware of the one on 137th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, opposite CCNY University. CCNY, community college? No, no. one of the finest universities Columbia? in America at that time. Columbia was down the road. We were on 137th Street, and Columbia was on 107th Street. Amsterdam and Broadway as our home was. And by coincidence, one of my grandsons is entering Columbia next week. Oh, that's nice. But the orphan asylum is gone. The orphan asylum as such the is gone. Died. The gym is still there. I make it a habit that whenever I fly into New York, the driver takes me around. In 1905, I understand the children. 19 what? 1905, before you were born. The children that went into the asylum were usually American born from the Lower East Side and from a family that one parent had deserted and the other one could not support the family um, alone. So the asylum was used, in effect, as a boarding school instead of are stereotype of orphanages where, um, where children live because they have no parents or, uh, or because they're looking to be adopted out. I understand that there weren't that many adoptions from this orphanage because it was more of a place 
for children to live until they could be returned to their family. And that sounds like that was the case with your family as well. I was not adopted out, and you're talking about living with other folks who the state rewarded with compensation in dollars and cents. Like foster if, parents? As foster parents. That never worked out as far as I knew it. Art Buckwall, famous writer, was in the home with me, and Art was a, went to a foster parent. Never worked out for him either. Was he there when you were there? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Good friend till he recently passed away. Oh, I had to Um. What were your relationships like with your siblings? Say that again, please. What were your relationships with your siblings like? Wonderful. Just, although many people felt sorry for us, that we were orphans, so to speak. And contrary to what you have just said, many of them were orphans. And in my era, and we developed wonderful, wonderful friendships until today. As a, for instance, the basketball team I played on in 1978 as a 16 year old played against all the universities in America that will have us, their JVs, and we beat them all, okay? Uh, you didn't play it. Oh, yes, I did. In I, 1978? In 19, uh, I was, Maybe in 19, when did I leave? No, 41. So that was. Uh, 38, maybe. 38, okay. Now, all of us continued our relationship until this day. The basketball team and all its members are still alive, except the one who was killed as a bombardier. But all the rest of them were 85, 86, 87 years old, and we meet each and every day on a telephone, and each week we have dinner at someone's house, and the relationship is a very strong relationship. They live down here? They live here in Florida. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I was able to bring them all down. And each year, if I may tell you the story, sure. in 1978, 19, I believe, I had made it pretty well and decided I was going to track the basketball team down wherever they were. Mm -hmm. And I had a, put on another secretary, and it took us a year, and it appeared that when the war ended, wherever they landed, one in San Diego, one in New York, one in San Francisco, one in Jersey. Wherever they landed, that was their home. They had no place to go. And during those years, they became wonderful citizens and raised beautiful families. And I was able to track them down. And I, at that time, lived in Miami during the winter season, and I had a home at, in Bay Harbor. And I invited them down and sent them to transportation and made arrangements at the Fountain Blue and rented Jackie Gleason's boat and many other nice things for the week that they were going to be spending with me. And uh, in contacting the last fella, 
he was, it turned out, to be an attorney in Los Angeles. And when I called, the girl said, oh, yes, he's here. I'll get him for you. And when she told him who was calling, he said, tell him I'm out to lunch, because he figured that I hadn't seen him for many years, and the only thing he remembers as kids, when we got our lunch money, we shot baskets for the money, and some guy won it all. So he figured I'm calling him for a touch. See? So I said, well, tell him to call me. I have something important I want to talk to him about. And uh, never returned my call. A couple of weeks later, I called him again. And a girl told me the same thing, and I said, no, no. You get him on the phone. Oh, how are you, Norm? How's everything in this? I said, I'm sending you a ticket. I have everybody else coming to Florida, and I reserved a room for you in Fountain Blue, and you're all set, and here's the time, and you come on down. Well. That young fella turned out to be T James Gardner's attorney, and the flat-nosed guy from San Francisco, whatever his name was, Carl Molden, nice guy too, Carl Molden. And he was a very prominent attorney. And he has a long story attached to how he got it, but the time when we got the 10 fellows that were left from the basketball team together, and they told their stories. They never, they came to my house the first night, and we never left my home. They spent on the floor six nights, anywhere we could, we had food come in, and the stories were absolutely remarkable. Now, you think of the people, the other children at the orphanage, you think of them as your brothers and sisters. Yes. Well, I'll get to that in a little bit. But I also want to know about your other brothers and sisters, how, just how your relationship was with them. In Wonderful general. relationship, but they didn't have what to eat, and I used to throw things over the fence because they were too old to get into the home, my older brothers and sisters. Oh. And I would throw food over the fence to keep them going. You must realize this was the Prussian years, sure. and you could never visualize, you children, of what went on in those days. Tell me about it. Couldn't, you couldn't, people, well, my, my father sold apples. Penny an apple, two cents an apple. You just could not visualize. People just didn't have it. Did he, um, he did that during the Depression. Did, what did he, did he have another occupation before the After that, he went to work at a hospital in New York City, but I had lived in Pittsburgh at that time, mm -hmm. see? But back to the story of these people, uh, from the basketball team. One fellow said, I was going to be like you guys and go into the army. I learned to play the trumpet in the home, and I requested to get into the Navy and blow reveille in the morning, <laughs> and they put me on an aircraft carrier, the Lexington, and the Japanese sunk it. He says, you know, I couldn't swim. <laughs> But they saved me, and they put me on another carrier, and they sunk that. And then they sent me home and said, we don't want you in the Navy anymore. Now, the children that, that were in the orphanage weren't always Jewish, were they? Mostly, 90, 95% or more were Jewish. They were, okay. Yes. Because they came from immigrant families? Immigrant families, but Europe. the home was established by the rich, rich German Jews mm -hmm. who came over to be in America, and they 
built this orphanage. So it was open to everybody, but, but it just happened that most of the people who needed it were Jewish immigrants. That's Is true. That right? That's true, as we have here in Boca. We, mm -hmm. we have a, a big facility that we built here in Boca, and it's open to everybody, but most of them are Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of it. Um, one thing I read about the orphanage was that they supported the Americanization of the immigrant children. They wanted to, them to be, become Americanized. Um, they wanted to limit parental visits. Limit what? Visits from parents. No, we were allowed to go out once a week to see anybody we wanted on Sunday. And um, they were very much in favor of, of education, public and vocational education. Absolutely correct. And another thing that um, maybe you could educate me on, uh, I read that they wanted to raise the children on Reform Judaism instead of the orthodoxy of their parents. And um, so I have two questions. One is, what is the difference between Reform and Orthodox Judaism? And why would they prefer the one? Well, the Orthodox are ultra-religious ultra people who are kosher and handle all of those things, and the women are not, can't go in and sit with the men in the synagogue. They have to sit separate than the men. In the Reform, it's all one, and everybody can do what they like, eat what they like, and eat how they like. Okay. And it's entirely, almost entirely different. Now, the, um, were, these, were most of the families Orthodox Jews because of where they had come from? On, on the contrary. Most of them in the home, as I knew them, were Reformed. And every morning, we would meet in temple, good, bad, or indifferent, and go to our services. The supervisor of the home used that as a facility to reprimand the children and on occasions when they did something wrong and he knew about it, he'd bring them up on the pulpit and whack them around. Most of us who were in there later on didn't see it as something of a way of life for Judaism as we found out later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was your Hebrew upbringing like? Was it mostly from the orphanage or, um, or was it different at home or was it consistent at both places? Only from the orphanage. Okay. We went to Hebrew school every week. They taught us about Judaism and what the meaning of Judaism means and what a Jew is and why he's persecuted and for what reasons and why it's important to be charitable and take care of your fellow man. And those were nice. We, we enjoyed that. We, like uh, any other religion, we were confirmed at eight, age 15, and you passed all those tests, which we enjoyed at Hebrew school. We didn't learn Hebrew as such or things like that, but we learned about life as such. And you learned the history of your people and the culture? Some of, of it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very enlightening to me at the time. I would think so, especially if you didn't learn that at home. It was all, it was all new to you then. Um, do you remember anything about prohibition? You were, you were a small child then. No, not really. I, I, I knew about it as such, uh, but I never knew anything about prohibition. I know a lot about it now. Okay. <laughs> um, 
what do you what else do you remember about the depression? You were 16 when it ended. So it was pretty much your whole childhood was Sure. Depression. I went through the whole thing. People uh, uh, just didn't have what to eat. Suicides were frequent rather than a rule in people. Uh, prominent people lost everything they had in many cases. And the truth of the matter is, whatever you could do to scrounge your living, like, like you will see today, where the uh, uh, people wait online for food, the homeless, that's what you had in those days for everyone almost. So you were very lucky to be be taken care of. Oh, the way it worked. well, we're lucky. Yeah. We are known as the lucky orphans. We were lucky. As I say, I threw stuff to my brothers over the fence so they could eat. We were lucky. We played ball together. We lived together. We cried together. We, we had a lot of nice things and a lot of things that were not so nice. On the nice side, the Warner Brothers would come up every uh, Christmas time, or in the Jewish religion, Hanukkah time, and they would bring us gifts, and they would bring either Mickey Rooney or June Prizer or some movie star up with them, and they built us a magnificent gym, which still stands today. A basketball gym, which still stands today. It's part of the school now, right? Is it part of the school? Part of CCNY, I believe. Oh, oh okay, okay. Part of CCNY. Um, the asylum closed in 1941. Is that why you left, or was it because you were at a certain age of, of 17? What prompted your leaving at Time. That? I was told it's time to leave. Oh, did yes. everybody leave when they were 17? Some hung around, were able to get till they were 18. But I remember Mr. Simmons telling me it's time to leave. Here's your $5, and here's your toothbrush. And I'll never forget, he said, Norman, I'm going to give you something that if you take advantage of, it's going to be very worthwhile to you. I said, well, tell me where I sleep tonight. He said, tonight you sleep here, but tomorrow you're gone. But after tomorrow, I'm giving you all the United States. Now you go get it. Okay? And I'll never forget that. What? Tell me how that must have felt walking out the door and, and, and leaving all that behind after it had been your home for so long. I felt very, I was very concerned. Where am I going? But a friend of mine who was in there with me, we decided we we're going to see America, just like Mr. Simmons said, and we got on a freight train and wound up in Seattle, Washington. That's a long way. <laughs> yep, it was a long way, and I went to work for the Fisher flour mill, packing the bags on the, on the trucks, and worked my way down the coast after a while. Uh, I, I loved Eugene, Oregon. That's a very, still stays in my memory 65 years later. It was a beautiful place and wound up in San Francisco. And uh, lived a short day or two in a hotel there. And wanted to check out, and I didn't have the money to check out with. So the manager said, well, how do you expect to pay for this? I said, if you give me a job, I'll work for you until I pay it off. He said, well, I want to keep your luggage here. You sit down over there, and I'll get back to you. And when I sat down over there, it was a little alcove. I was sitting down, and a man came to me and 
tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I heard that whole conversation. And I looked up at him and I thought for a while he was less than right. He might have been an unusual individual. And he took out a $20 bill. And he gave me the $20 bill, which had to be like 200 Yeah. And I said, what do I have to do for this? He says, not a thing. He said, I'm from Montana. And the people in Montana, when they see people in trouble, if we can, we like to help them out. That lived with me the rest of my life. Just that one, a moment like that. That's, yeah. That's amazing. From there, I went down to Los Angeles, worked in the Los Angeles Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Wilmington, California, San Pedro, California. And as a, you know, now I'm 18 or 19 and, you know, wanting to see the world and go down to Mexico and see what that was like and, and then work my way back to the East Coast. And, I could say I worked in pretty near every state in the Union. Ditch digger, waiter, busboy, carnival man, or whatever it took in those days to make a living. Did you serve during World War II? No, I did not. I was 4F. I, during my time in the home, uh, I had a perforated peptic ulcer and the army would not take me, and I fought like heck to try to get in, and all my friends were in, and I couldn't get in, no matter what. You had always lived pretty much in a Jewish world at the, in your youth. Right? I think so, yes. And I, I'm thinking, here you are suddenly out among all these people who are not Jewish from coast to coast, and. Um, and how did you find people? Did you run across any anti-Semitism, or did you um, did, did people just accept you as you were? No, they did not accept me as I was. Being that I came out of the orphan home, I remember filing an application for General Electric in uh, either Westinghouse or some other company. And in those days, when you filled out an application, you had to put your religion. So when you put Hebrew, your job was already filled. You couldn't get a job, period. Uh, I remember an incident in the Los Angeles shipbuilding dry dock company. I worked on a night shift that time, and some big seven foot guy, maybe twice as wide, he said, the kind of guys like you, that we're in this war, Adolf Hitler should cut all your no white off. And I said, why don't you knock it off, see? And I said, he said, well, that's a true statement. Kind of you people, we're all in this war. And you want to make it personal? And I looked at him and I said, no, I don't want to make it personal. Were you aware of any family or friends' families that were lost during the Holocaust at that time? Did yes, you have, well, did you have knowledge of no, it at that time? more than that, there were many children that could not get into our home. They got in temporarily, and they would farm them out in the United States to different farms, to different people, mostly Christian people. And these kids never knew what their upbringing was till later on in life, which I can explain to you how we got them together. Okay. See? And, and uh, do you want me to do that now? Just, sure, briefly. Well, uh, in running these parties of, of the having my friends come down, I decided, doing well, 
I'm going to take them every year somewhere in the world. And I've taken them and their wives all over the world. Once a year, we go away for a couple of weeks. And then after we did the first trip, I said, if we can make this available to myself for these people, why don't I try to get all the people who were in the home together? And I rented the Bahia Mall in Fort Lauderdale and got 500 of them to come down to our get-together. How and, did you manage to find them? Well, that was very interesting. You would find one. Who do you remember and where do they live? You'd find another. And so you would try until you got them together. And then we had a little pamphlet that some people still sent out to whoever they knew called the Rising Bell. The Rising Bell? Bell, B-E-L-L. -L. Okay. That means for us in the home knew when that bell rang, we had to get up. See? And that went out to people and any of your friends that you know, and where are they? And I remember one, many specific incidents, but one in particular, where a fella came in to see me in Pittsburgh, where I live, and he lived there, and we were glad to see each other, and I said, did you ever, I know you went with, uh, one of the Walensky girls, did you ever know where Pearl Walensky was? He said, do I know? She lived next door to me in San Diego, and I know Finkelstein is her name. Here's her number. Here's everything that you want to know about her. And I called her and said that we're having a party at the Bahiamar, which we had for the next 25 years, but this was one of the years. And I wonder if you want to come. And she said, who is this? And I said, this is Norman Rails, your old boyfriend. <laughs> well, I knew I was still on the line, but she wasn't talking. <laughs> she had passed out. Oh, my god! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was her name? Pearl Walensky. And then mm -hmm. when she got up, <laughs> she said, I couldn't believe it after all these years. But when we had our parties, I, I'll tell you something very interesting. We had, had pictures like this all over when we were children and what we did in the camp we went to and all of us and these people would come to these parties and they would say to their husbands or their wives, oh, that was me in 33, or that was me in, when I was in 35. But there were a group of people that never wanted anybody to know they were in an orphan home. So they never told their spouse. And they lived with them for 40 or 50 years mm -hmm. and never told them anything. And then, of course, as we matured, the rising bell got better and better. And we would send the rising bell and say, uh, there's a party going to happen, always between the Super Bowl and the playoff. We had one week there that we had the party every year and still do. Uh, and never told their husband or wives, and finally they got the rising bell, and now they're in their late 60s or early 70s, and they want to see all of their old friends. who they hadn't seen for 50 years, maybe. And uh, the wife or the husband would say, I got to tell you something. I 
I never told you all our lives. And I want to go. So to just to see them was just beautiful. And I'm sure that those relationships between those husbands and wives was that much closer after sharing something. Of course. Yeah. When you so, get something off your chest. Sure. And it's, it's been wonderful just to see some of the things that happen and, and, and the wonderful stories and, and how all of them, by and large, to the greatest degree, matured and raised beautiful families and doctors, lawyers, nurses, all kinds of prominent people, as Art Buckwald, uh, fellows that uh, played in the Philharmonic Orchestra because we had training in music at the home. Uh, it was a very, very nice place most of the time. Did you find, when you saw the, how they turned out, did you find that, that most of them uh, held on to the, the, um, the Judaism that had been implanted in them? Yes. 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 They had, they had held yes. on to that through their lives. With yes. Their families. That's nice. That's very nice. Without a question, they held on to their Judaism. That's right. Because we would, you know, I remember when we marched to school. In those days, we wore knickers. And all the kids, in the, when we were marching, oh, those are those Jewish orphan kids. Those are the. And, we went through that and going to school, public school. We went to a school in the home up until the sixth grade. After that, we went to public schools. Oh, okay. But you moved together to a Yes, we, well, yeah. we had to protect ourselves. That's what we were doing. So you did run into problems when you were in high school or junior high school? Oh, yes. I've yeah. run into problems being Jewish most of my life, see? And I imagine that's changed through time because uh, our country's changed a lot. Our, our culture has changed. You have to say that once more for me. I imagine it has changed, though, um, from the time you were young until now because our society has changed. Am I wrong? To some degree, yes. Okay. Yes, to some degree it has. In Boca Raton, which we, I guess you want to get into, I'd be very I'm, I'm happy. almost there. Okay. <laughs> yes, that um, has changed. Actually, my, my next question was, when did you first come to Florida? Not to Boca, but to Florida. I, when I first came to Florida, I came, I was working with a carnival. Carnival being that it, uh, you had a, a stand and you pitched the stand and throw the balls and knock them down and you get those prizes. We don't tell you what to take. You take whatever you like, you know. And, and it finished in Jacksonville, Florida. Do you remember the name of the carnival? No. no. Okay. No, I don't. It last stop was Jacksonville, Florida. And that had to be, well, I'm 85 now. That had to be uh, 60 some odd years, 62 years ago, perhaps. And I said I'd never been to Miami, and I'd like to see what it was like. And I knew of a fella that was in a home with me that, li that lived in Miami, and I called him and he said, come on, you'll stay with me when you come down. And I said, fine. And uh, I went down to Miami, and fell in love with Florida, where to this day, of all my travels around the world, there's nothing like Southern Florida for me. And uh, when I got to my friend's uh, apartment, 
I said, I have all these clothes I have to take to a dry cleaner. Do you have any idea where there's a dry cleaner around here? And he said, yes. He said, you want to go around the corner? There's three sisters that run the dry cleaner. The father, who had retired from Pittsburgh, came down to uh, Florida and opened a dry cleaning establishment. And I went in there, and that's where I met my wife-to-be. Say, and three years later, we were married, and I was in love with Florida then, but more so today than ever before. What was your wife's full name? Ruth Abramson, A-B-R-A-M-S-O-N. And was she your age? Yes. And what do you know about her family? Oh, a lot. I know a whole lot about her family. Her family, that's how I started in business. I was down here, and then I would leave and go to work and come back in the winter time. And, and then we decided after three years to get married. Were her and, parents? Pardon? Were her parents immigrants? Yes, from the Soviet Union. Oh. Both of them were. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, when we decided to get married, I was always a, a very hard worker, no matter what I did. And I had a, an uncle who had a clothing store in New York City. And I went to work for him for a while. And on Sunday, which was my day off, they had another branch that was open on Sunday, and I went to work there. She went to work as a bookkeeper in New York. And I worked there for a year or so, uh, whatever it was, and came vacation time. She said, uh, I think it's time that you go to Pittsburgh. I said, Pittsburgh, what am I going to do in Pittsburgh? She said, uh, my father and my brothers are in the home improvement industry. And the way you work, you can do exceedingly well. And it's vacation time. Before I knew it, I had a ticket. And I was on my way to Pittsburgh, and I went out to work with a brother-in-law of mine in Oil City, Pennsylvania, which is maybe 75 miles north of Pittsburgh, where he had an office, and he told me what to do, go out and knock at the doors, and you talk to the people, and you bring me in, and... Do you remember, so, I'm sorry, do you remember her parents' first names? Her parents' first name, Esther and David. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I went out to work, and that week, while I made 125 bucks a week in New York City, I made $300 that week for all the leads I brought him into, and he sold the job. And I called my wife to tell her the good news that I was very interested. She said, I have very good news for you. Before you say anything to me, Norman, you were just made the manager of the Jersey City Ripley Clothing Store. I said, Ruth, darling, I'll take care of my uncle. I'll call him, and I'll go see him. But I'm never coming back that way. I'm staying in Pittsburgh, so prepare everything for Pittsburgh. And we did. And like. Two young newlyweds, we, we both worked very hard and I prospered extremely well in the business to the point where several years later, my father-in-law and my brother-in-laws all worked with me, see? And then I built warehouses and it goes on and on. What was the, when you went out on your own with your own home improvement company, what was the name of your company? 
Braille's Construction Company. Okay, from there, I opened offices in 10 different cities in and around Pennsylvania. And I had an office in Jacksonville, and I had an office in Charlotte, North Carolina. I had a number of offices throughout the nation. And then I realized that I was supplying or buying supplies for all of my home improvements, so I was going to open a home a supply house. So you were doing remodeling jobs? Yes. We, okay. Rather, we, than, rather than building homes from scratch, you were doing... Never remodeling. built a home. Right. You were doing remodeling. Remodeling. Okay. Never built a home. And uh, opened to build a supply, and then another one, and another one, and so it went on. What and was did that called? Mid-South Builder Supply. Very... Had a very fine name because even in a home improvement business, which was a, a business that many people said was in disrepute, was not correct. You had a few bad apples like you do in any business. And I can tell you of incidents that happened along the line with banks and other people that I had the privilege to work with. But prospered in the builder supply business with my partner, Merv Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, and made enough money that we bought the Texas Rangers baseball team. And then I bought the Kennedy Bank in Washington and owned the Kennedy Bank. Was this all in the 70s? Yes. Okay. Or early, late 60s, too. And 70s also. And uh, had a fantastic life in all of these wonderful things. And you know, by that time, you had children that were, that were coming up uh, quite a bit. They must have really enjoyed the baseball. They loved baseball. They loved all sports. They loved their mother dearly. They loved their father. Uh, tell me... Tell me um, about your children? Well, I had four boys that, that, that I remember when my wife was giving birth to the first boy, Dr. Baroni, our doctor, shook me in the waiting room and he said, not him, another doctor shook me and said, Mr. O'Brien, you have a nice girl. I said, my name's not O'Brien. He said, oh, I'm sorry. And then Baroni came in and said, Norman, you have a nice big, healthy boy. I said, I need four. He said, I'll take that order and I'll <laughs> see what I can do for you. And that's what we had. Four wonderful, wonderful boys. Terrific guys. Still to this day, very prominent businessmen worldwide. Listened to everything that was worthwhile and put it to use, and... Uh, what do you think your greatest gift to them has been? My ability to sit down with them and let them know how important they really are. I think of in, in any time I talk to a parent about their children, I tell them, you travel most of your time as I did. But I found when I was home, my time was with my children. To give you, for instance, without being obnoxious, okay? Mm -hmm. In the community I lived in Washington area, all the people who were congressmen and ultimately went up to be senators, and then several of them, President of the United States, who were friends of mine. I knew them and their kids, and we all grew up together in the same area. And one time, I was talking to one of my sons, 
And I had made a pact with my wife that no matter who calls, when I'm with the children, tell them I'm up the street, and as soon as I get back, I'll call them. And President Ford called me, who, Gerald Ford, was a great friend of mine. And she said, Mr. President, he's up the street, and as soon as he gets back, he'll call you. Okay, Ruth, fine. We were great friends of theirs. Now, my kids heard that. And they said, the President of the United States is calling you dead, and here he's spending his time with us. Well, that's what I like to convey to parents. When you're with your children, be with them. Don't take your calls. Let them know how important they are. And they'll talk to you about anything. And I, I used to play ball with them on the weekends. My kids, we all uh, love to play baseball, stickball. And I remember, here's an incident that stuck with my kids, even to this day, my one son in particular, we were going up to the schoolyard to play ball. And I said, you know, Steve, I, I don't have any cash. I want to stop at the bank and I'll give him a check and I want to cash a check for $100 and then we'll come back and play ball. He said, fine, Dad. And I gave the girl the check and she gave me my $100, put it in an envelope. And as we're getting out of the car to play ball, I count it, and it's $110. And I said, you know, Steve, that lady gave us $110 for 100 That money don't belong to us. Hop right back in, and we turned around and went back to the bank. And I said to the girl, I believe you made a mistake. She said, no, we don't make mistakes. I said, we'll count this money. She said, $110. I said, how much was the check I gave you? She said, $100. Thank you very much. Well, my son is 53 years old today, chairman of the board of one of the biggest companies in the world in Danaher. And he always relates that story. That when, when he was little, he remembers it. See? So it's very important that the parents who have limited amount of time with their children, whatever it may be, you, John, whatever it is they're working, but when they're home, give those kids a break. Spend some time with them. Let them know how important they are. And they'll tell you everything. Anything you want to know, they're not afraid to tell you, as long as you, you're all right with them. My four sons, for, for instance, everyone I took out of jail, not for anything serious, throwing a snowball at a car, a police car, paper in the school with paper at graduation, one guy getting smart with the policeman when he told him to move, and he was going to show the girl he's with that he ain't moving, so he wound up in a can. <laughs> and so it went. But I was always the first one there for them. What happened? Dad, you don't know what happened, you know? And we were able to work it out, see? They trust you. If they have that trust, then... They feel like they can be honest. Next yeah. to your children, I have the greatest guys that anybody could ever want. Where did you live then when you were raising your family? Did you stay in Pittsburgh? Yes, I loved or, Pittsburgh. Or Washington, you said you Yeah, I, I loved Pittsburgh and I stayed there a number of years. But then I felt I wanted to expose my four sons to a little more than Pittsburgh had to offer. And I had an office in the Washington area, actually, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And I said to my wife, I said, Ruth, I think if you came down to Washington, it might be something you'd like. And boy, she fell in love with it right away. And she said, let's go. When you were um, 
acquainted with President Ford, for instance, or people like him, what was the relationship based on? Was it was it social? If he called you, was he calling to ask to, to uh, bounce something off of you? You know, as as sort of a no, it was more, more social. It was social. Yes, and even golf? even till the day he died, it was yeah. social. Did you play golf? Pardon? Did no, I didn't golf? play golf, but there's interesting stories with that. See, he played golf, and he wasn't much of a golfer. And I remember uh, one incident where uh, my son was building a home in uh, uh, Beaver Creek, Colorado, and, and President Ford had a home there in Beaver Creek. He liked to ski and play golf. And my son called me and said, geez, Dad, I have nothing to do today. I wonder if you can call the president and see if he'd like, he's, up, he's in Beaver Creek now, Maybe he'd like to play around the golf and take me with him. And I called him at home, President Ford, and I said, Mr. President, my son is building this home, and it was right near him. And uh, he'd like to play around the golf. He said, where is he at? I said, he's, he's at the Hyatt. He said, OK, I'll see what I can do. And my son called me back 20 minutes later, President called him, said he's sending his driver, pick him up, and they'll play around the golf together. Oh, that's wonderful. See, so we had a, a wonderful relationship, even uh, uh, to when I would go out, they had another home in, uh, uh, in uh, California, and I would go out to California. I was on the board of the Betty Ford uh, uh, Clinic. Yes. And, and I remember one incident very vividly. Uh, there were 10 of us at the meeting, and he would get up and bring me a bottle of water, like over there. I said, thank you, Mr. President. And then he, I'd finish it, he'd bring me another bottle of water. I said, no, I said, you embarrass me. The President of the United States bringing me water. I'm going to get up. You sit down, Mr. President, and I'll get you the water. He said, no, no. I want to 